just a, a little bit of perspective. Uh, a little over a hundred years ago, as quantum mechanics uh, was developed, it was quite mysterious and it completely changed the way people think about the natural world and the universe. And, and now, uh, all these years later, we're still struggling to really understand it. I, I have a nice quote here uh, that Einstein uh, sent in a letter to Schrodinger. Uh, this was 1950, so about halfway through this <clears throat> period. Uh, but he said, it is quite hard to accept that we are still in the stage of babies in their diapers. And it is not surprising that the fellows are unwilling to admit this even to themselves. It is hard to admit uh, these major changes that happen. One of the cha another change that I think has happened since quantum mechanics has been this whole study of uh, nonlinear dynamics and self-organization. And I tried to talk about that a little in the introduction yesterday, how we've moved from these models of linear causality uh, to circular causality and what, what this means and, and what it suggests and what it means about novelty in the universe and uh, how we really understand how things, uh, about how things come about and how things evolve and, and uh, just a, a, a whole new view and understanding. Uh, and this is particularly important when we try to take on a subject like free will uh, because as mentioned already, physics doesn't really provide us with any kind of model uh, for novelty uh, before we come to, for organized novelty I should say, before we come to uh, emergence. Now you can have randomness and quantum fluctuations, uh, but they're by definition random. And whereas self-organizing and emergent systems um, follow behaviors that are that are novel and specific, and uh, as I said, really change the way we look at things. So we have an interesting program today. I think it's going to be a lot of fun this afternoon. Uh, our first speaker will be Evan Thompson. And just a little bit about Evan, who's right here. Uh, he's a professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto. His main areas of research are cognitive science, phenomenology, and the philosophy of mind. His books include Mind in Life, Biology, Phenomenology, and the Sciences of Mind, that's Harvard University Press, Color Vision, a study in cognitive science and the philosophy of perception, the Embodied Mind, Cognitive Science, and Human Experience, which he co-authored with Francisco Varela and Eleanor Roche. And he is also co-editor with Philip David Zalazo and Morris Moscovich of the Cambridge Handbook of Consciousness. So please join me in welcoming Evan Thompson. Let me just take a minute to get this up properly. There we go. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Well, it's a great um, pleasure and honor to be here and to speak to you this afternoon. Um, the title of my talk is a little bit different from the title uh, on the schedule that was circulated, but really the material is, um, is, is basically the same. I'm just compulsive with titles and constantly um, change them. Um, to begin, I would like to show you this picture, which is an image of a uh, Tibetan Buddhist monk in the laboratory of Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin. And he is wearing a, a cap made up of electrodes, a dense array EEG cap that records electrical activity at the scalp associated with the underlying activity of the brain, particularly of the, of the cortical uh, structures of the brain. So what I want to talk to you about today is the relevance of this kind of research, research on the neural correlates of contemplative mental training, the relevance of this sort of research for our theme of um, free will and, and uh, neuroscience. And in the interests of I suppose you could say full disclosure, I'd like to say um, why this is important to me and where I'm coming from. My guiding motivation is that combining mind-brain science and contemplative experience holds the promise or raises the prospect of a new kind of self-knowledge, really a kind of self-knowledge that's unprecedented from both the point of view of the Western scientific tradition and from the point of view of the Asian um, contemplative traditions. 
and I want to examine volition, I'll say what I mean specifically about uh, by volition in a minute, I want to examine volition specifically from this standpoint. And just to give this a bit of a broader contextual framing, um, why, why is this important? Speaking personally now, it seems to me that there are really two regressive tendencies that, that mark our era. I'm thinking in particular of the, of the dialogue involving science and religion and science and spirituality. So on the one hand, we have the resurgence of a kind of religious extremism with various outmoded belief systems. And on the other hand, we have the entrenchment of scientific reductionism, a kind of hard-nosed scientific reductionism, exemplified, for example, by um, Dawkins and, and Dennett and others. And the problem with both of these extremes is that neither recognizes the value of the contemplative mind as a source of wisdom and well-being and as a source of knowledge relevant to mind-brain science. So my hope is to work towards an alternative to these extremes that integrates mind-brain science and contemplative knowledge. And it's from this standpoint that I want to address the topic of um, volition and consciousness. OK, so let's start with the question of what is volition. And like Alan Wallace, I'm a great admirer of William James. So I want to read to you, re read to you a few things William James had to say about volition. This is from the Principles of Psychology. He said, we reach the heart of our inquiry. This is in his chapter on the will. We reach the heart of our inquiry into volition when we ask by what process it is that the thought of any given object comes to prevail stably in the mind. Attention with effort is all that any case of volition implies. And I think you can hear the resonance immediately of this thought with what um, Alan was, was talking about um, earlier today. James continued, he said, the essential achievement of the will, in short, when it is most voluntary, is to attend, and those are James's uh, capital letters, is to attend to a difficult object and hold it fast before the mind. Effort of attention is thus the essential phenomenon of will. Now, I think this point is important because, um, going back to some, some, some things that were also said earlier today, we can easily fall into the trap of reifying the notion of the will and the notion of free will. And if we ask ourselves what experientially or what phenomenologically we might mean by free will, then it seems to me that James really goes to the heart of it here, that effort of attention is the essential phenomenon of will, the ability to hold the attention on a chosen object, a chosen object, and to switch the attention to a chosen object and hold it there. Okay, so given that notion, I want to proceed, and so you can keep track, and so I can keep track of where I where we are. Um, this is the this is the framework for what I want to present to you today. I want to say some things, philosophical things, I suppose you could say, about relating mind and brain, or methodological, epistemological points about the task of relating mind and brain. And then I want to spend some time talking about contemplative neuroscience, by which I mean research involving neuroscience and meditation, contemplative mind training. And then towards the end, I want to direct the discussion um, pointedly to um, the topic of volition and the concept of emergence that um, is, is the theme for our, or one of the themes for our afternoon. Okay, so first then, relating mind and brain. And when I use mind here, I'm really thinking of the experiential mind. This is a way of picturing what's going on in neuroscience at the moment when, from a, speaking from a neuroscientific point of view, we investigate the relationship between various kinds of mental functions or various kinds of experiences and the brain. What we're actually interested in as scientists is this area here, that is the relationship between experience and brain activity. 